Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to talk about electrical testers, and we'd like to thank Bradley Templin for liking and sharing the podcast. And we'd also like to thank CastBox for featuring us again in their education section. And if you're looking for a good podcast app for an Android device, you can check out CastBox, and it's C-A-S-T-B-O-X. In the 1920s, one of the first commercial multimeters was designed to look like a pocket watch. Hmm. And pocket watches in the 1500s only had an hour hand, Hmm. to give you an idea of the time. They didn't add a minute hand until the 1600s. So a pocket watch has a hinged cover that would open so you could see the time, or it would have grill work to protect the moving parts. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until about 1610 when glass was used to cover the face. Hmm. (laughs) Wild, huh? Yes. Some of the first handheld digital multimeters were made by the Fluke Company, F-L-U-K-E, in the 1970s. Hmm. For doing electrical projects around the house, the three main testers are an outlet tester, a non-contact electrical tester, and a multimeter. And there are other testers like a clamp meter that has jaws to clamp around wires and you're measuring current, but Mm -hmm. they're mainly for professionals. So an outlet tester plugs into an outlet, it has lights that light up that let you know whether the outlet's on, it also can do other tests. And what I like about an outlet tester is if you're working on that circuit, you can plug this in, the lights light up, and then you run to your service panel and turn off the power to that circuit, and you can look over and immediately know whether the power's off, hmm. rather than having to get you know a traditional tester go in and put probes into the slots in the outlet. So it just makes it fast to find out whether the power's off to that circuit. An outlet tester is also going to let you know whether the hot and neutral wires are wired correctly. So you have the hot, either the black or the red in most cases, going to the brass screw on the side with the narrow slot. And the neutral wire, the white wire, is going to the silver screws on the side with the longer slots in an outlet. So if an outlet is wired in reverse, which is called reverse polarity, it can be a shock hazard with lamps. So the lamp is going to turn on and off, but when it's off, the socket is live and can be deadly Mm. under the right conditions. And it's also going to let you know if you have a disconnected neutral or a ground wire. It's going to have a label on the tester itself, and usually you're going to see it labeled with an open ground or an open neutral. And whatever you see open, that just means it's a disconnected wire. Mm. Some outlet testers are going to have a button so you can test a GFCI, and you should be testing your GFCIs once a month if they're not self-testing. Like with an outlet tester? Yes. So you're going to plug in the outlet tester, you're going to press this button, and it's going to see whether it shuts off in a fraction of a second if there's a... What about the test button on a GFCI? Yeah, and you should be using the test button too. So Does anybody do that? <laughs> no, you're supposed to do it once a month, and they found that people just aren't testing them, and all GFCIs fail over time. In right. fact, manufacturers are recommending that you replace your GFCIs once every 10 to 12 years. Hmm. So GFCIs after 2015 are now self-testing. See, that and, makes sense. And, <laughs> and they'll shut down when they fail at the end of its life. And read the instructions. So what do you mean shut down? Like you can't so, use it like as right, an outlet? It, right, it's completely dead hmm. because you don't have the protection anymore. So the old ones, if you weren't testing it, you thought you were protected by a GFCI, right. but it's still working like an outlet, right. but it can be a shock hazard. So hmm. the new technology, they're actually much safer. But I would look at the GFCI when I install it. Some of them blink, you know, when it's at the end of its life. Some of them, a light just comes on continuously. So you need to know what manufacturer, what... what they should talk. <laughs> Eventually, (laughs) soon. So what's interesting about the outlet testers with that button for the GFCI is it's using the ground to test the GFCI to confirm that it's working. And it's not going to work on an ungrounded GFCI. How if you, could you if, have an ungrounded GFCI? So if you have an older home that doesn't have a ground wire and you just have like the old outlets with just two slots, right. it doesn't have the ground hole, you should replace it with a GFCI and it's going to be much safer. But if you take a GFCI and it's ungrounded, you need to use one of these labels that come with a GFCI and it says no equipment ground. And if you don't have that or if you've rewired a GFCI like this and you didn't put I a label on it. I don't understand the point of this. 
So if you have an ungrounded outlet, that's that's your safety. So if you so it's going to prevent you from getting but electrocuted. It's ungrounded. But it's ungrounded. But a GFCI, if it senses an imbalance between the power coming into the GFCI and leaving on the neutral wire, if you're grounded, if, if the electricity is trying to go through you right. in a fraction of a second, it's going to turn itself off. It's going to use the internal breaker. And it's triggering if there's an imbalance of four to six milliamps. And a shock as small as four amps under the right conditions can put your heart in fibrillation and potentially cause death. Hmm. So it's smart if you have an older home with only two slot outlets. There's no ground on your outlets. Mm -hmm. You can replace that with a GFCI and it's going to be safer. But you need to label it so that everybody knows that there's not a ground on this. Because when you put that GFCI in, it's going to have a, a ground slot. You know, it's going to have right. the two slots plus that circular ground. Mm -hmm. But like, it, like in that outlet, if you put a surge suppressor in there, the surge suppressor needs the ground to actually operate. So now you don't have a surge protector, you only have a power strip. Bummer. <laughs> How many outlets is a GFCI protecting? So it depends on the manufacturer. Many of the 15 amp GFCIs are going to protect 10 outlets on the load side, or a lot of electricians will call that downstream. With a 20 amp GFCI, they protect about eight outlets downstream. So if it's not like the first outlet in the circuit, it's not protecting anything? Yes, it's everything past the GFCI. So you need, if you take off multiple, if you're replacing multiple outlets, or let's say you just want to replace a GFCI and you want to protect everything else in a circuit, you're going to have to take all the outlets out and then test the wires, find the very first hot wire. That box is going to be the first box in that circuit. So you put your GFCI there, everything else downstream is going to be protected. So you don't need to buy more GFCIs. Right. You just need one GFCI and then everything on the load side is going to be protected. Hmm. Since we're talking about ungrounded outlets, if you have an Shall old... Shall we be talking about electrical testing? <laughs> so if you have a, the outlets with just the two slots, so you don't have a ground on it, a lot of times you're using the adapters that go from a three-prong to a two-prong. And on that cheater plug, they call it, there's a little metal tab that you take out the screw on your outlet cover. You plug in this three-prong to two-prong adapter, and then you take that screw, and you screw down on that little tab hmm. on the plug. So this isn't code in some areas. And the previous style, so the old three-prong to two-prong adapter had a grounding wire mm -hmm. rather than that tab. And what they found was that wire got pushed into the hot slot on some outlets, and it actually caused a few electrocutions. Hmm. So they discontinued those. You can't get those anymore. And in fact, in 1969, only half of the receptacles were three-prong in the U.S. Wow. And in 1971, all new construction was required to have grounded outlets. Hmm. So with that three-prong to two-prong adapter, if your home is conduit or has flexible metal conduit and the conduit is grounded all the way back to the service panel, when you use that center screw for your outlet cover and screw it into that tab, mm -hmm. it actually grounds it, hmm. which is interesting. But if you have non-metallic cable with no ground, so mm -hmm. you have an older home with non-metallic cable, then that is not a ground. Hmm. And if you want to talk about using a multimeter, if you take a multimeter with two probes and you put the black probe into the narrow slot, which is your hot, and you touch the red probe to the center screw on an outlet, mm -hmm. that's going to let you know, let's say you have a two-slot outlet, by testing from the small slot to the center screw, you'll know whether you're, you have conduit or not, or whether it's grounded all the way back to the service panel. Oh, huh, interesting. A non-contact electrical tester will let you know if you have electric on a circuit without getting dangerously close to live wires. Mm -hmm. And there's two main styles. One that's just always on, and then one that has an on-off button. Some models are going to show you a range of voltage levels with an LED light. Some are going to have sound and light to identify a hot wire, and some just light up. Mm -hmm. And it's always good practice to test a known live circuit to verify the non-contact tester is working, mm. and then use this to test your project, and then recheck it on a known live circuit, and that way you know, you're guaranteed that the battery didn't accidentally go out you know, during, <laughs> during the process. And then, you know, one trick you can do if you're trying to test your non-contact electrical tester to make sure it's working, mm -hmm. you can just rub it against your hair, and the static electricity from your hair will mm -hmm. actually test it whether it's working or not. Yes, you did this yesterday. 
It was the coolest thing ever, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Some non-contact electrical testers have built-in flashlights, mm -hmm. which is very convenient. And I just did a project where I was trying to find a disconnected neutral wire in a circuit. And did you I, find it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh man, it took me a long time. But I was looking for this, and the one box that I was looking into, I used a non-contact electrical tester to test the outlet before I removed it. I turned off the breaker. Mm -hmm. That outlet was dead, so I knew I got that circuit. I pulled the outlet out. I started separating all the wires. Mm -hmm. And because it was a big box, it was like a junction box, I took that non-contact electrical tester and I pushed it into the back of the box, and there was actually another circuit going through this box. Wow. So there were live wires in the back of this. Mm -hmm. And if I would have just started disconnecting all these wire nuts, right, yeah. I, it, it could have been a shock hazard. And no more podcasts. Right. <laughs> so, you know, a non-contact tester is really nice because, you know, rather than having to take wires apart, mm -hmm. and, and especially this was deep in a box, I knew immediately there was another circuit I had to turn off. Mm -hmm. A non-contact tester is going to make it easy to find the hot wire when you're working on switches, if you're trying to find the feed wire or the common wire, for example, on a three-way switch. Mm -hmm. And then in older homes, if you have insulation that's all the same color, it's going to let you know very quickly which one is the hot wire so you can mark it. One of the problems, though, with non-contact testers is most of them don't detect low voltage. For what? Like if you're doorbells and right, thermostats? It, exactly. Hmm. Multimeters are going to come analog or digital. For electrical projects around the house, a multimeter is going to allow you to test AC, DC, and continuity. So AC is alternating current, and you're testing your household current, so switches, outlets, and lights at 120 volts. Right. It's going to also test 240 volts to appliances like a water heater. DC is direct current, and you're testing batteries. Continuity is testing to see if current is flowing through something, like a fuse or a switch. Mm -hmm. An analog multimeter is inexpensive and very versatile, and it's going to have a main knob to choose between the settings and ranges. A display is usually going to have four ranges. You've got two probes, an insulated area behind the metal tips, and one of the probes is going to be red, one's going to be black. The red is positive, the black is negative. The display is very confusing, though, if you don't know what you're doing. Well, it's funny. When you look at it, it's almost overwhelming. It's going to have all these numbers and symbols and lines, different mm -hmm. colors. But if you just look at the number at the end of each range, it's actually very easy to figure out. Mm -hmm. So a common analog multimeter is going to have four ranges. It's going to start from 0 to 10 on one line, 0 to 50, 0 to 150, and 0 to 300. And then around the knob, you're going to have an area for DC, mm -hmm. V, so direct current volts, and it only has four settings. So the numbers are 10, 50, 150, and 300, which matches up to the last number mm -hmm. of the ranges on the display. And the same thing, you're going to have four settings for ACV, so alternating current in volts. And it's 10, 50, 150, and 300. And you might have milliamps, DC. I've never really used that for projects around the house. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have an ohm setting for continuity, so OHM. So to give you an idea how easy they are to use, if you're testing batteries, let's say you're testing double A's, triple A's, C's, or D's, those are all 1.5 volts, you're going to turn the knob to the number just above what you're testing. So in this case, with this multimeter, we would turn our knob to 10 dCV, and we're only looking at the range on that display that ends in 10. We don't care about any of the other numbers or mm -hmm. colors or ranges. And when I touch so you're it... you're saying a range. It's more like a line. It's an arc that it goes in, right? Right, right. So when you're looking at it, you've got 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, for example, right. and it's got all these little hash marks in between them. So you're just paying attention to that line. Right, because above it, you've got 0 to 50 above that, 0 to 150, and 0 to 300 right, above that. Right, but we're ignoring so... those because we're doing the battery. Exactly. How easy. Yes. So that pointer or the needle, if you touch it on the two ends of your battery, should be between 1 and 2 in that range and you don't care about anything else on it. Mm -hmm. If you want to test a 9-volt battery, you would turn the knob to 10 dCV, so just the number above what we're testing, mm -hmm. and it should end right at 9. If you're testing a car battery at 12 volts, for example, you're going to turn the knob to 50 dCV, so direct current, and you're only looking at that second range that ends in 50, mm -hmm. so it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you're testing an outlet or a switch at 120 volts, you're going to turn the knob to the number just above what you're testing. So in this case, we'd turn it to 150 ACV, and then we'd read that range that ends in 150. 
to test 240 volts, we would turn the knob to 300 AC, and we're only looking at that range that ends in 300. So very easy to use this. Mm -hmm. To test a fuse, you're going to turn the knob to OHM for ohms, and this uses the internal battery to see if current is flowing through the fuse. So if a fuse is good, that needle is going to go all the way across the range to zero on the range marked OHM. And you can... But that zero is on the opposite side of the other zeros. Right, yeah. So if you're looking at the display for all of the other settings, zero is on the left side. Mm -hmm. For OHM, zero is on the right side. Right, just to make it a little confusing. <laughs> so you can also test switches if they're good. You can put the probes on the screw terminals and turn it on and off for like a single pole switch. On a three-way switch, you would test from the dark-colored common screw to each one of the travelers, flipping the lever up and down. One is going to be operated with one screw terminal. The lever the other direction is going to be the other screw terminal. This is while it's wired? No, no. You would, In fact, you would never... When you have your multimeter on ohms, you're using your internal battery. You never want to plug this into anything that has live current or you'll destroy, you'll short out your multimeter. See, that's so, important to say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So whenever you're testing a switch, this is the switch is not connected okay. and you're just testing the screw terminals. All right. You can also use the ohm setting to see if there's a short between the hot and neutral or hot and ground. If the insulation's melted, let's say behind the wall and the wires are touching, this is going to show up when you test. So let's How? say let's say we've removed a couple outlets and we know there's a short somewhere. Why would you know that? because a breaker keeps tripping. Okay. And so, so like this project that I was working on, I, I knew that there was a problem with the neutral wire somewhere. So we should be taking advice from you? <laughs> well, I did solve it. So <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we turn it to continuity, so ohms, uh, our meter, we have the electric off, and now I can touch the black and the white wire on one cable at the same time. If I have the outlets off and I touch those two wires, if the wires are good, I'm not going to show any continuity. My needle will not move. Okay. But if the wires are touching somewhere behind the wall and I touch the hot and the black or the hot and the ground mm -hmm. and it the needle goes all the way across to zero, I know right. that the wires are bad somewhere behind the wall. So I, I can isolate what section okay. of the wire I, I need to work on. Hmm. If you have a digital multimeter, sometimes you're going to have AC, DC, and OHM on it. Or, instead of that, you could have a V with a wavy line over it, a V with a solid line and three dashes under it, or an omega symbol. Because that's not confusing. Yeah, boy, first time I saw it, I, I had no <laughs> idea. So the Greek omega symbol was used around 800 BC as the last letter in the Greek alphabet. Mm -hmm. And it looks like a really fancy upside-down U. Right. And the lowercase omega symbol mm -hmm. looks like a lowercase W. Hmm. Weird, isn't it? Totally. And they use that symbol for ohms, so it's a unit of electrical resistance. And it was named after the German physicist George Ohm. Hmm. Isn't that cool? His last name is O-H-M. <laughs> what do those symbols mean? So if you have the V with the wavy symbol, that's alternating current. If you have the V with the line and three dashes under the line, that's direct current. How'd they come up with this? Yeah. <laughs> and then the omega symbol is either testing resistance or continuity. And your display... Are you saving that much room by not doing just an AC? Well, this is for professionals, Cindy. <laughs> so your display is going to have digital number readouts, and your settings around the knob can have more or less settings. So volts, for example, may just have 250 and 200. Mm -hmm. But the key is always turn your knob to the number just above what you're testing, right? and you won't have a problem. And some of the digital multimeters are also going to have settings with different symbols, like the sound wave symbol, if you're testing for continuity and it's just going to give you a sound if there's continuity rather, okay. than, rather than reading a range or it might have that diode symbol. And I like that sound setting for projects like lamp repair. So if you're changing a lamp cord or a socket on a lamp and you don't know which side of the cord is hot and which is neutral, you can put it on your sound setting and touch one probe to the narrow plug and that narrow plug is your hot. Mm -hmm. The other side of the cord you're going to have two wires touch each wire and the one that makes the sound is connected to that plug. Hmm. So now you know that that wire is your hot, you're going to mark it, and that wire is going to go to the brass screw on your socket, the other wire will go to the silver screw and it's going to be wired properly and safe. With a digital multimeter you can also measure resistance for a water heater element. So the formula is volts squared divided by watts and that's going to give you resistance 
plus or minus two. And oh, all duh. everybody knows that. And all elements <laughs> are marked with the watts and the volts, so you can't screw up. Mm -hmm. You're going to turn off the power to the water heater. You're going to double check it with your multimeter to make sure the power is off. Once you've confirmed the power's off, you're going to take off the cover, remove the wires to the elements, and now you're going to touch the two screw terminals. You're going to turn it to the omega symbol, and let's say, for example, your element is 240 volts and 5,500 watts. Mm -hmm. So it's volt squared, so you're going to go 240 times 240, which is 57,600. You're going to divide it by your watts, which is 5,500, and you're going to get 10.47. So when you touch the two probes on the screw terminals of your element, if it's too higher or too less than 10.47, you know that your element is good. If it's outside that range, you need to change the element. So it's a very easy way to test right. the element. You know what makes a great podcast is listening to you do math. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> and your spelling, too, of course. I don't think you've done that yet. If you have a three-slot outlet, you can just test if there's power to the circuit by putting your red probe on the narrow slot, the black probe in the wide slot, and that's going to tell you whether there's power there. You can test if it's grounded by putting the red probe in the narrow slot and the black probe to the ground hole. You can also test for reverse polarity, putting the red probe in the wide slot and then the black probe to the ground hole. And if you get power there, you know that it's wired backwards. Is there like instructions with this? I don't know whether they do a lot of tests in the instructions with a multimeter. I think it's mainly on the multimeter. Well, how are you supposed to know? We'll, we'll listen to the Fix It Home Improvement Podcast <laughs> weekly. So when you're testing outlets, you could have a switched outlet where half is on all the time and half is connected to a switch. And if you're just checking one side, the power could be off on that side from the switch, no. but the other side is live. So it could be a shock hazard mm. when you remove it. Yeah. Some top-rated outlet testers, Sperry, Klein, and Amprobe. Non-contact electrical testers, Gardner, Bender, Sperry, Amprobe, Klein, and Milwaukee. And Greenlee, it's G-R-E-E-N-L-E-E. -E -E. They have a dual-tip non-contact electrical tester. And by pushing those two tips into a tamper-resistant outlet, it's mm -hmm. going to open up the shutters. So you can use it just like a regular non-contact tester, but it's got that unique head on it, so it'll open up a tamper-resistant outlet. What do you do if you don't have that? Sometimes it's hard if you have uh, a non-contact electrical tester that's not real sensitive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether the outlet has power, so you actually have to take off the cover, oh. and then you're able to tell. But with this green Lee, you can just push it right into the shutters, hmm. and uh, you'll know right away. With multimeters, Fluke, F-L-U-K-E, Amprobe, it's A-M-P-R-O-B-E, Innova, I-N-N-O-V-A, Klein, X-Tech, E-X-T-E-C-H, and Gardner Bender. Do you have anything else to add? Make sure you're always turning off the power to any circuit you're working on. Even a small shock under the right conditions could be deadly. If you have an outlet tester, a non-contact electrical tester, and a multimeter, you're going to be able to do all the basic electrical projects around your house. And if you shop around, you can get these pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, the Google Play Music app, iHeartRadio, and CastBox. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our books, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail. Dot com. You can follow Cindy on Twitter at Fixit Cohost. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.